We rise for the gathering. Gathered by the Holy Spirit, we hear and proclaim the saving word of God for all the world. We give thanks for that saving word and all the gifts of God, who then sends us to share the good news we have received and to care for those in need. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives us all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide us now so that following your Son, we may walk safely through the wilderness of this world toward the life you alone can give through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
taken from the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 31. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. We rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you the day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the coming Christ. On the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, there are two large figures of what appear to be men. One figure is a person unclothed, looking bewildered and beaten down, very much weakened by whatever conditions he is experiencing in his life at that moment. And rather limply, he holds his hand heavenward. That's a picture of us, my friends, hurting and run down at our wit's end. And across the ceiling, reaching towards the man, is another person, one with a great white beard and long flowing hair. He has a strong arm extended down to the man, and that is the image of God. At least according to Michelangelo, the painter who did this picture, He depicts God extending his power to us, and we desperately reaching to receive that power. Unfortunately, the man in Michelangelo's painting has not yet been transformed by this power from God because there is this gap that exists between the hand of God and the hand of humans in the picture. Indeed, when that gap exists between us and God, when our hand does not rest, In God's hands, we see ourselves in our weakness and our helplessness and our hurt. 
But the story of Lent, the message of God in Jesus, is that that connection has been made. There's no longer this chasm between the hand of God and our hands. And even as we have limply lifted our hand, crying out to God and help, God in Jesus has taken the hand of humankind and bestowed upon us healing for our hearts. And if we are to understand how this hand of healing works, we must understand how the hand of God has been effective in all of our existence. The hand that comes from God is the very hand of life. It is through that hand that we have life, physically and spiritually. Our bodies are a creation of God. Humanity has not been duplicated, nor do I think it will ever be. The complexity, the beauty, the potential of the human body, it's a great statement of God's power and the work of God's hand. And Genesis tells us that God, with God's own hands, took the dust of the earth and formed it into his likeness and breathed into it the breath of life. James Weldon Johnson, one of my favorite African-American poets, expresses this well at the end of his poem, The Creation. He writes, Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river he sat down with his head in his hands. And God thought and thought till he thought, I'll make me a man. And up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay, and by the bank of the river, God knelt down, and there the great God Almighty, who lit the sun and flung the stars to the most far corners of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand, this great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, knelt down in the dust, tolling over a lump of clay, till he shaped it in his own image. And then into it he blew the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are descendants of that first creation, brothers and sisters. We are the byproducts of God's creative hand. We are the first statement of God that creation is still in effect even in our bodies today. And yet even as God creates our physical person, God also by his hand creates our spiritual person. For even as God took the simple element of clay and formed it into a body, God takes the simple element of water and the word and creates a new spirit in us through the power of baptism. Through baptism, God gives us new life. But God is also much more. God is also a God of compassion that touches our hearts in tender ways. The word compassion literally means God aches for us. For some people, our nerves exist in our shoulders and our necks. A shoulder rub is often a true gift for the people that have that. For others, it might exist in our stomach. My wife will tell you that on Sunday mornings, I do not eat before I preach. Because if I do, I'll give it back to you. My nerves are that great. The only reason I look calm before I preach is because in 37 years I've learned how to hide those nerves. Some people get headaches. I don't get headaches that often. My wife has one. It's me that I live with her, so that's her biggest headache. Some people have migraines, and they are debilitating if you have migraines. In Jesus' time, their compassion, their love, their concern for others did not exist in the heart. It was in the digestive system. So just as we would say, my heart aches for you, they would say, my gut aches for you. And we've all been in those situations, especially the physical suffering of another person, where our stomachs literally churn in pain for them. When the Bible says that God has compassion, it means that God is aching for us. God has so much love for us that he hurts for us. And God translated that love into action. The psalmist wrote, my times are in your hands. 
Deliver me from my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Not only does the hand of God have compassion for us, it also touches us in healing ways. In 37 years as a pastor, I've probably made thousands of visits in hospitals and nursing homes. I've shared countless words of prayer and scripture at the bedsides of the sick and the hurting. I've ministered to families in grief at over 450 funerals. And yet, it never ceases to amaze me when I'm in a hospital setting and there's this healing that happens that God brings and the doctors can't explain it. They usually say, well, we don't have a logical reason for how this happened. There's no sign of the cancer, though. There's no illness. So, have a nice life. But what about the people who are not healed? What about the people who continue to suffer and ultimately lose the battle, as we like to say? Does that mean God doesn't love them as much as He loved the people who were healed? Does it mean that their faith was less than the ones who were restored? As the Apostle Paul would say, by no means. For if we say that, then we deny that God's love is motivated by His compassion for us. And it is God's love that causes God to deal with our hurts in just the way that is best, even though we might not comprehend it. At times, God may even allow some illness in our lives or some suffering. And please notice I said allow, not cause. We cannot make God the cause of trouble. We live in an imperfect world, and God does not cause evil, but God does promise that he will use even the things we suffer to work for our good. Last Sunday, I told the story of my high school, and I said that I chose the lesser of three evils to be accepted, that I could cuss pretty good, and I told the story about this young man who called me out when I cussed playing softball. Well, that young man's name was Sam, Sam Cruz. He was a friend of mine. I've known him since the eighth grade or had known him. We played a lot of softball and basketball together. We survived junior high and high school together. And his faith and his friendship were always a source of comfort as well as challenge. Sam would never let me off the hook. Well, Sam went to college. He became a registered nurse. He got married. He moved to Las Vegas, of all places. He was raising two children, as we were. And even though we lived miles apart, we tried to keep in contact. So back in 1994, Sam was diagnosed with leukemia. I was devastated. But Sam kept the faith. He had two total blood transfusions to fight the disease, and after the second one, I called Sam to see how he was doing to try to cheer him up. And he said, I'm doing pretty good. But you know, he said, I win either way. What do you mean? I asked him. He said, well, if we beat the disease, he replied, I win. I get to stay with my wife and children and my family and my friends. If we can't beat it, I win. I get to go and be with Jesus that much sooner. My friend Sam went to be with the Lord six months after that phone call. God has created us in his love and he sustains us and he secures us. In his compassion, he holds us in the hollow of his hand. And it will be by God's grace that we will be welcomed with our hurting hands into that place of ultimate healing in his kingdom. Amen.
drives away all fear. It makes the confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Prayers reflect the wideness of God's mercy for the whole world for the church universal, its ministry, and the mission of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. For the well-being of creation, for peace and justice in the world, the nations, and those in authority, the community. Lord, in your mercy. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely, for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy for the congregation, for our special concerns, especially Carrie, Tom, Courtney, Donna, Juliana, Linda, Sandy, Karina, Rebecca, Pastor Sarah, Jim, Tom, Janice, Mark and Cindy, Lietta, our confirmation class, Audrey, Aubrey Bauer, Braden Bauer, Claire Cousineau, Michael Longabaugh, Lamar Longabaugh, Jonathan Dan, and all those struggling with COVID-19 all over the world, and the people of Ukraine, Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We give thanksgiving for the word. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness. You called forth beauty from chaos and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and you call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love, for your word of life, O God. Send forth your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith. Increase our hope and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before the blessing, I wanted to take a moment to thank Katie for playing for us tonight and Mom for singing along and leading us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.